Hi, welcome to part one of our free training on meditation. You know, the first question you might ask is why do I need to meditate? And I think the answer to that is we live in a stressful world. I think most of us know that life is very stressful. Ancient humans may have gotten chased by a lion once in a while, but we're chased by a chronic lion every single day of our life 24 seven. The stress seems to never go away. You know, when people can't sleep at night, which is epidemic in our culture, it's because the cortisol, the stress-fighting hormones that are supposed to settle down at night, they never settle down because we're under so much stress throughout the day. And then we can't sleep at night. We have a situation where our bodies are, are incessantly thinking, worrying, handling stress, dealing with that, never able to settle down. We know a couple of things now. When you're under that kind of stress, that stress is processed through your intestinal tract. We know that 95% of your serotonin and many other neurotransmitters like dopamine are manufactured in your gut. And they're manufactured by microbes, which make up about 90% of the cells of the human body, and manufacture the, uh, the uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, and do the heavy lifting for most of our physiological function, like our immune system and our mental health. They know that if you take certain probiotics, that it helps you support mental clarity and less anxiety. They know now that they can measure the microbes of a young child and they can determine based on the microbes that they see what type of brain function they're gonna have as an adult. Are they gonna be a scientist? Are they gonna be a artist? They can tell by the microbes because the microbes affect our mind and there's many pathways that it takes. There's a nerve called our vagus nerve that goes from our gut to our brain and there are other pathways as well that we're only beginning to discover. We now know that when you're under a lot of stress, your good microbes go south and your bad microbes go north. We know that if you take the poop out of, a, out of an anxious mouse and put it into a calm mouse, the calm mouse gets anxious. We know that your microbes affect your mental clarity and your composure and your calm. We know that when you're under a lot of stress, those good bugs go south and we become vulnerable to all types of disorders, mental, emotional, as well as physical complaints or conditions. So why meditate? Well, more than ever, learning how to turn off your mind, the crazy incessant thinking, will allow us to sever the relationship between excess stress pounding away at your intestinal tract, taking out your good bugs, taking out your neurotransmitters, taking out the, the, you know, the bug's ability to, to do the support and the heavy lifting for most of our physiological function. We accelerate the aging process via stress. We've known that stress is the major cause of disease for, for many, many years. We are now beginning to really understand the com well more of the complete picture and mechanism of how that stress works now meditation you got to know is one of the most powerful and most researched and most well documented and most well studied techniques to reduce stress and we know stress has so many impacts on our health that it's extremely valuable for us to learn how to still the mind to silence the mind to make the line mind more like a calm lake most of us are, you know, are handling stress in such a way we feel exhausted throughout the day. We finish our day with feeling wasted, like we need to go home and go to sleep and recover from the long day. What if you were able to finish your day with the same energy as you started? What if you were able to handle stress throughout the day like water off a duck's back? What if you didn't need to crave dark chocolate or candy or coffee or different injectables, things that stimulate you to get through the day and you're able to do it fine? And I'm talking about secret injectables, sugar, a donut, bread, coffee, tea, shopping, candy, popcorn, even just going to the movies. How many things do we do throughout the day to stimulate us in a way that satisfies us in some way. How is it that we're not able to be satisfied on our own? Is that something that we can achieve? You know, our culture has created a situation where people are so overstimulated that they've activated a hormone called, a uh, neurotransmitter called dopamine. And dopamine is a chemical that is the, I gotta have it right now hormone. And our culture is sort of swung in this direction of I gotta have it right now. I gotta have more money, I gotta shop, I gotta have that car, I gotta have that, that new pair of shoes, I have to have what 
seems to, everybody else seems to have the new iPhone. I have to have it right now to be satisfied. And we go into debt to get it. And the mind has become addicted to that stimulating hormone to the point where, you know, we idolize athletics who do extreme things, risk their lives, base jump off of skyscrapers, you know, jump off of big, huge cliffs to stimulate this dopamine within themselves, which they get, you know, high from for just a couple of seconds and risk their life for it. When, when you meditate, you can literally produce the same brain chemistry by actually meditating. Now, it's not gonna make for the greatest story in the bar or in the nightclub that night, but it's something that is sustainable. Most of these extreme athletes where they're doing such extreme sports to, uh, to somehow gain and experience this runner's high, this zone, this euphoric experience that we idolize, most of these athletes are risking their life and, and many of them actually die in the process. And if they don't die in the process, as they get older, they beat themselves up so much that their body becomes so old before it's time that they can't support that kind of activity to get the same juice so they go into a depression. This has actually been well documented. Our pendulum in our culture has shifted in a direction that I think is dangerous. And I think that we've lost something. I like to call it the eye of the hurricane, the calm. The bigger the calm, the more powerful the wind. And I think that we can create that inner calm. And there are many ways to do it. My first book, Body, Mind, and Sport, was all about reproducing the runner's high by using nasal breathing techniques, which I'm gonna talk about as I teach you a meditation today in this class of how to use breathing techniques to still your mind and to drop into a meditative state and to produce the eye of the hurricane. Remember, the bigger the eye of the hurricane, the more powerful the winds, the more productive you can be. Most of us, I would say, are living in the winds of the hurricane, feeling the stress of those winds, dodging refrigerators in those winds, feeling exhausted at the end of their day. What if I could tell you you could, you could finish your day with the same energy as you started and wake up feeling incredibly refreshed and not feeling raced or rushed or stressed out throughout your day, not feeling anxious about certain things that when you were younger in your 20s, it didn't seem to matter. But now our body has been, is unable to handle the stress the way it once did. We can reset that. We can rebuild the nervous system's reserve of handling stress by dipping the cloth in the dye of your own silence, the own, your own eye of the hurricane. But we have to want to create it. Our dopamine receptors want us to go out here and stimulate ourselves to get it. But the more you stimulate that dopamine to get that high, which we do, the more of a stimulant that you need. When you go shopping, for example, your dopamine levels begin to rise and begin to rise. And as you shop for the pair of shoes and you try a couple on, your dopamine levels are starting to peak and you're getting excited and feeling really high in this whole process. And then when you finally pick out that perfect pair of shoes and you take it to the counter and you swipe your card and you buy those shoes, your dopamine levels plummet. And you feel, wow, what just happened? I feel sort of, I lost that, that juice. So the brain then says, ooh boy, and it pulls down the menu of how do I get myself back up to that mountaintop that I was just on that felt so good, that high. We're all kind of crazy drug addicts in our own way. And then the brain pulls down the menu and says, well, I remember I passed a Starbucks, I remember that logo, and there was a Mrs. Fields, and there was a Cinnabon, and, 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 and you say to your friend, boy, would you like a latte? Next thing you know, you're walking towards the Starbucks you saw on the way in and your dopamine levels begin to rise again. But here's the problem. The next time you want to get that high, you need you know, a double shot latte. You need uh, a, 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 a couple of pair of shoes or a more expensive pair of shoes. And again, we find ourselves going into debt, doing whatever we can to stimulate ourselves to get that satisfaction, but it's, it's limited. We cannot produce enough of it to sustain ourselves. Now, there is a hormone called oxytocin, which gives you the exact same high, the exact same juice, but it doesn't deplete. The more you stimulate dopamine, the bigger the stimulant you need, and we wear out and burn out and exhaust ourselves and even risk our life. Oxytocin is a different kind of hormone. It's a love, bonding, giving. They call it the, the philanthropic high. When people give, they get high. They produce oxytocin. It's a chemical that's produced when a mother gives birth and, and it surges in the baby and in the dad and in the mom and they bond for life and they, and they, and they feel this oxytocin connection 
throughout their life, they care and they love each other in a powerful, powerful way. So this is something that, that um, we can produce on a regular basis by learning how to still our mind, learning how to meditate, learning how to uh, become more established in the eye of the hurricane. There's an old saying that says, that says um, first establish being the calm, the eye of the hurricane, and then perform action. It's an old Vedic saying. And it's the, it's the point of the whole thing. You know, everything in nature, you know, has, has this kind of ability to experience what I call the coexistence of opposites. The sun sits still and planets spin around it. It does nothing and accomplishes everything. And this atom sits still with a nucleus, sits still in an atom and electrons and protons seem to spin around it. A hurricane spins around the silent center. We are sort of microcosms of these powerful forces of nature. And if we can experience that internal experience of calm, I really believe there's, there's nothing that we can't do. I believe that the human body is unlimited in potential, but it's limited by stress. And if we keep pushing the body into stress and then have to recover from that stress and then push it again and recover and push it again, we're going to build up a level of stress that will eventually break our body down. We know now that that'll take out your gut bugs, your microbes, your neurotransmitters, your immune system, and most of the, of the physiological functions in your body that support optimal health. We know that that's a fact. We know that when you're under a lot of stress, whether chronic stress, when you're sitting next to someone that you don't like, when you're involved in a situation where you're stressed out with a mother-in-law or a sister or a brother or a family member, and it really irks you, we all now know that that is, and a real science supports that that stress will, will take out your good health and your immunity. There's now well-documented scientific pathways. So more than ever, we have to learn how to still our mind. We have to learn how to turn off this crazy brain of ours. And the more stressed we are, the more we think and the more we worry. And, and one of the mechanisms for that is that when you're under a lot of stress, we take an upper chest breath, we gasp for air. And most of us start walking around breathing like little rabbits, little tiny shallow breaths in and little tiny shallow breaths out. Well, it turns out that there's receptors in the upper chest, which are called stress receptors. So if you saw a bear in the woods, you would take a <gasps> upper chest gasping breath that would tell your body life's an emergency, get you up a tree and save your life. The receptors that predominate in the lower lobes of your lungs, which we rarely breathe into, are calming, repair, rejuvenative receptors. So when you breathe through your nose in particular, you drive air all the way down through these turbines, turbinates in your nose, and drive them all the way down into the lower lobes of your lungs. And those lower lungs are where, lungs are where 80% of your blood is, 60 to 80% of the blood is. The blood sort of is a gravity-fed system. It hangs out in the lower part of the lungs. So the potential for great oxygen exchange and waste removal happens most efficiently in the lower lobes of your lungs. But most of us, because we breathe like rabbits, we're under a lot of stress, 26,000 emergency breaths a day we take, little tiny shallow rabbit breaths. The rib cage also has a thing called the elastic recoil. It wants to squeeze on your heart and your lungs, 26,000 breaths per day. That's what we experience when we're living our daily life. If we're under a lot of stress, have been emotionally traumatized, right? And all of us have experienced something along those lines. The rib cage becomes tight and we start breathing like a rabbit, activating 26 little emergency messages all day long, which tell your brain that life is an emergency and we stay in this incessant pattern of a thinking and worrying and stressing and stressing. And that stress takes out our, is processed through our gut, takes out our good bugs and our good bugs take out, again, our neurotransmitters that support how we think and function and maintain a level of composure and calm in our nervous system. It's really quite simple, really. So again, why not learn how to still our mind? Well, one of the most powerful techniques to do that is your breath. So in this meditation that I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you how to breathe through your nose and learn how to still your mind through your nose. In fact, we have a, this is the first meditation in our meditation course called the Transformational Awareness Technique. And the first technique to use meditation as a transformational technique is in fact, to learn how to still your mind. And the best way to do that, the best anchor for all this crazy incessant thinking is to breathe 
through your nose. And that's my first book, Body, Mind, and Sport, was all about learning how to exercise breathing through your nose. And we proved that when you exercise and breathe through your nose, that the brain goes into an alpha meditative calm state during vigorous exercise. That was pretty cool. And when you <gasps> open your mouth and huff and puff when you exercise, the brain goes into a beta stressed out state during exercise. So my goal in my first book was, why don't we teach people how to use exercise as a model for handling stress from a calm place? Again, the bigger the eye of the hurricane, the more powerful the winds. So I guess my goal was to reproduce that thing called the runner's high. That thing athletes say was my best race was my easiest race. But that can happen in every aspect of your life, not just while you're running or, or skydiving or something. It can happen while you're writing, while you're reading, while you're playing the flute. It can happen in your life while you're interacting with your family. It's, it's, it can happen throughout your life. And that's the goal of meditation, is to take that calm, establish a level of being, a big eye of the hurricane that you can hail from, and then from that place, experience dynamic activity in your life, but not be taken out by it, not be exhausted by it. This is the power of meditation. So instead of stimulating yourself with more caffeine, and more stimulating behavior to get through the day and get juiced or get high or get through it, why not start to dip the cloth in the dye of your real power and establish that inner composure and calm? That's what we're here to do. And if you do that, you'll find the need for the shopping, the need for the, the stimulation and the caffeine will disappear because you're establishing it and creating it yourself with a hormone that's completely different than the, than the self-limiting hormone of dopamine, this non-exhaustive hormone oxytocin. The more that you give in love and bond and create that silence, the more you produce. There's no limit to how much you can produce of the oxytocin. That's the really cool thing. So on one hand, we have this pendulum shift to this extreme way of life that we've created on this planet in our culture. On the other hand, is this old, old knowledge of becoming still inside yourself. Yeah, it takes a little practice. You know, lots of folks come to me and say, I try meditating and I can't do it. And I just keep thinking, 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 and I can't stop. And, and I just finally gave up. And that's why one of the reasons why I created the Transformational Awareness Technique. And this first meditation I'm gonna teach you right now is a meditation that's gonna allow you to, for everyone to experience the benefit of meditation because we're gonna use a breathing technique to, to put oxygen into your brain. And when oxygen goes into your brain, the brain's gonna feel like, whoa, I'm not gonna suffocate. I don't have to worry and incessantly think. I can still myself and be calm. That's the value of this first meditation. And the first couple of meditations that I teach in this class, and this, is, this transformation awareness technique is six meditations for emotional freedom. The goal of my course is not just to get you to meditate and still your mind, I want that. I want you to have that experience. But also I want you to take that calm with you and transform your life. And I think you all know that it's this crazy mind of ours, these emotional patterns of behavior that we know pound away at our gut and take out our bugs and do all that. We know how it works now. We know that that stress uh, is incessant. And we know that when we're under a lot of stress, it takes our body out. So when you learn to meditate, you learn how to still your mind and be able to handle stress like water off a duck's back. That's what we're going to do. And then take that awareness with you into your life so you can transform these old mental and emotional patterns of behavior that aren't serving you any longer. And that is gonna be the topic of part two in this series on, uh, on how to meditate. And I'll teach you another meditation in part two. But here in part one, I wanna teach you how to create that eye of the hurricane, that eye of the storm. And it's gonna be done with breathing. The more that you breathe, the more you pump oxygen and prana into your brain. And many of us breathe like little tiny rabbits, shallow breaths. We are not oxygenating ourselves in an efficient manner. We don't use all five lobes of our lungs. Most of the, and I can go on and on about this, but one of the, the reasons why we, we, we don't get the benefit from breathing is because breathing is a detoxifying waste removal technique as much as it is an oxygen in technique, it's a waste out technique. And if we don't breathe into the lower lobes of our lungs, we don't exchange the waste as efficiently as we can. 
And that can build up on our body and compromise our, our ability ultimately to get the oxygen into the deep tissues. And we begin to start to become tired and lethargic and unable again to handle stress. So the breathing is gonna pump oxygen, Ayurveda calls it life force or prana into the brain. And we're gonna, we're gonna give that, that, um, that oxygen the ability to calm yourself down. And this first technique is one I've been teaching for years. It's called the one minute meditation. So it's a very simple technique. And we're gonna do it now. We can sit together, um, sit with your sort of back straight. And you're gonna breathe through your nose, in and out through your nose, like a bellows, in through the lower, middle, upper chest. In. Very simple. You do that for about 30 seconds, which is almost 30 breaths, and you're gonna sit still for 30 seconds. You can do this meditation uh, anytime. You can do it in your car, you can do it in your office. I encourage you to do this meditation, uh, it takes a minute, right? Do it before you go into the office, when you wake up in the morning, before you go to bed. Uh, before you, when you go to get gas, you can get the pump in, you can sit there and you can close the door and breathe and be still. Before you go into the grocery store, before, when you're in the office, close the door, sit, put a sticky note on your, on, your, uh, on your computer or in your car dashboard and said breathe or one minute meditation. In two days, I'm, we're gonna give you part two of this, of this free meditation course. And uh, I challenge you in the next two days to do this one minute meditation five to 10 times a day. And if I promise you, if you don't feel a significant difference in how you're feeling composed and calm and handling stress, then, then I don't know what to tell you. I, I've been teaching this thing for so many years and I've just seen so many miracles. It really change your life miracles by people learning how to use this technique. And in the beginning, breathing is a powerful anchor to turn, to help the brain get used to going down to the bottom of the leg and feeling that composure and calm. We want an anchor to take the brain to that calm place. That's what we're gonna do with this first meditation is train the brain, which is so crazy and so wants to go stimulation and get stimulated by so many things. We have to use a powerful anchor like breathing to train it. And that's why people have difficulty just going into meditation because their brain just can't do that. So I give you six simple baby steps to learn and train your brain to be still, and then you can't just sit there and meditate. You gotta put it into action, and that's what I teach you in this transformational awareness technique is how to take this into transformational action. It's a powerful, powerful course. So here we go, the one minute meditation. We're gonna breathe for 30 seconds, and we're gonna be still. And remember, you got two days before the next class, I challenge you to do this five to 10 times a day, okay? All right, here we go, so we're gonna breathe deeply in and deeply out as you can for 30 breaths. Be still for 30 seconds. If you get a little dizzy, just back off. Usually the dizziness goes away in a day or two, so just know that that's because you're not used to carrying oxygen in your brain. And we're gonna retrain your brain how to do that, handle that, feel good with that, and be calm with that, okay? Here we go. So we're gonna breathe in. And just relax your breath and be still for 30 seconds. And take a big breath, slowly open your eyes. Become aware of how you feel, a little bit more calm, a little bit more silent. We just began the process of creating the eye of the hurricane. Now I want you to
you to do that five to ten times a day until I see you again and see if you can experience this calm, this eye of the hurricane, and take it with you into the day, resetting it along the way five to ten times. All right, see you next time. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com.